What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, May 29th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Vietnam's shift back to coal is now under EU scrutiny, trying to just get cheap electric uh, electricity, and they go under EU scrutiny. It's unbelievable. Next up, big oil companies facing mounting legal challenges from climate-obsessed groups this is it's just unbelievable so we'll cover this one next up from noble ambition to corporate tokenism the rise and fall of esg i mean this is this is this this is like a roller coaster you're up then you're down who knows where it goes from here next up houston storm reveals downside of forced electrification and then finally new microgrid to provide resilience for houston data center and the grid stool then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on with oil and gas prices today. Overall markets today doing okay. Um, we did see um, oil rise above eighty dollars. Nice, nice for uh, all you oil and gas investors out there. Um, no API crude oil inventories uh, with the holiday yes or on Monday. So we will see that. Uh, you'll see that later this afternoon as you guys listen to this. And then on Thursday, we'll get the EIA numbers. Um, and then we'll wrap up with energy transfer buying um, WTG Midstream, which is a Permian-based midstream uh you know, network of pipe um, for about $3.25 billion uh, from a few different um, equity holders there. We will cover all that in a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. First off, guys, if you are in the DFW area, you survived the apocalypse yesterday. Holy smokes, Stu. Uh, hey, we've got Michael uh, on energynewsbeat.co or .com. Go to uh, resources. You can go up and take a look at Power Outage US. Texas has got 1,050,000 people without power today. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give my quick antidote. I was out. I like to get a good run in in the morning. Helps calm me down um, uh, so I don't get too wound up. But I was out there in the morning, Stu K. It went from nothing happening, like it was calm as a whistle, to all of a sudden I heard the tornado sirens go off. Wow. That was a little creepy. And then, within a, with no joke, within about 60 seconds, torrential downpour, I thought I was going to, I thought me and my dog were going to get blown off of our feet. Most people know Sandy sitting behind me. She wasn't a fan of it. And then a tree branch broke off, flew into a, I think it was a telephone line. I had never seen an explosion like that. Sandy about jumped out of her skin, was not happy with it. It was pretty crazy, Stu. I, I, I'll be honest, I, had, I, I got caught with my pants down about a mile and a half away from my house and was like, oh no. Well, uh, getting ready for our event on Thursday with Ted Cruz, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, I was on the phone with Genevieve. She was without power. David Blackman was trying to, we were producing David Blackman's podcast. He was without power with uh, at Doomberg. So, you know, they, there goes power <laughs> it was unbelievable so hope everybody if you're in the dfw or you're one of those million people listening in in, in texas that have uh their power out hopefully it turns back on but let's go ahead and dive into today's show Stu. where do you want to kick us off hey let's go to vietnam shift back to coal is under eu scrutiny here's a tagline on it vietnam is moving away from green energy and back to coal to ensure factories avoid blackouts after costly shortages in 2023, this doesn't sit well with the EU's green ambitions for the South Asian country. I got one thing to say for the EU and the United States and any of the other G7 countries putting your finger in other people's businesses. Go away. Let people put power in. This is stupid. Vietnam needs to go back to coal because it's reliable. Um, Coal-fired power plants account for one-third of the country's total installed power plant. In uh, date, just there recently has generated 67% uh, of the power sometimes is hit up by coal. 
But I think this is the worst part. So the heat, what, 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 what spurred all of this is this heat wave that's happening in Vietnam right now, uh, right. basically in the months of May and June of last year, okay, led to massive power outages across the north of the country. Factories owned by some of the largest, and now I'm just going to read straight from the article, factories owned by some of the largest tech firms, including tech giant Samsung, experienced weeks of blackout that, according to the Vietnamese government, caused one Point four billion in economic losses, roughly 0.3 percentage points of the GDP. That's pretty ridiculous. You can't do that. A noticeable part of your GDP is shot because the EU is trying to tell Vietnam how it should produce its energy. And, and it comes in here from uh, President uh, Ursula. She says that leaked private briefing notes from the UK government officials cast doubts on the ability of Vietnam's environmental industry to influence other skeptical ministries of the green transition, according to re, uh, reports of Politico Europe. Here's my problem on this. Let's encourage natural gas and replace those coal power fire plants with clean burning natural gas. It's cheaper. You can do LNG imports. You can put in pipelines. And let's reduce. I'm all in for saving the planet. Yes. I think from Vietnam's perspective, though, they don't have the capital to go build an LNG import terminal. It And yeah. the infrastructure to build out the LNG. If, if you don't have any natural gas, uh, you know, if you're not able to go drill for natural gas yourself, if you're not able to afford the capital to be able to build an LNG import facility, I mean, at some point you're, you, you've got to go back to coal. Exactly. Uh, let's see. Hmm. This also goes into a bigger picture, and that is I wish the G7 would stay out of Africa. Let's go with Africa first and get people power first. Let's get people power. All right. Let me go to the next story before I get all worked up here. Uh, big oil companies face mounting legal challenges from climate obsessed folks. These climate obsessed folks need to go hang out in Europe with Ursula. This is just ridiculous. Shockingly, 80% of the 8 billion people on this planet live on less than $10 a day. And almost half of the world, over 3 billion, live on less than $2.50. And they struggle to stay alive. But yet we are trying to force them uh, in saying that oil is the problem. Oil is not the problem here, gang. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. These number, and again, I'm just going to read straight from the article here. The number of lawsuits against oil and gas companies has risen significantly over the past few years. And you think, oh, well, ESG, and we'll talk about ESG in a bit. ESG has been around for a bit now. It's not necessarily just uh, the last no. couple of years things. But in the last few years, we've seen 32 lawsuits that are targeting you know, oil and gas and fossil fuel companies that are attempting to have them, quote, pay for climate change, uh, a kind of a not a comprehensive, but a major list of some of these companies um, that are being sued or include Exxon, BP, Chevron, Sunco, Suncor, but Sunco and Suncor are both Canadian companies, Shell, ConocoPhillips, Coke Industries and the American Petroleum Institute. They're coming after the lobbyists now, too, which, hey, fair enough. You know, but API right. didn't have any money. I, see, here's the thing about these lawsuits. They're usually always going after companies that have money. You notice they're not going after the little guys um, because well, that, isn't everybody complicit then? Why isn't it a class action lawsuit against everybody? Well, you know, Exxon Mobil, either if they lose, is going to pay up or they'll just be willing to settle because it's cheaper than the litigation. Right. But it's still a it's still going after fossil fuels when that's not the problem. The problem is the government's spending money. Climate change is is not climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. We're going to say climate change happens. It's either by sea, uh, cloud cloud seeding, cloud uh, you know however you want to do it. It is man made and it is being done. However you want to say it. But it's not caused by fossil fuels. Yeah. It's, um, anyway, it's, it's it's definitely not. The, um, since the world, this is a great quote. Since the world is yet to identify the replacement for fossil fuels that are based off of the supply chain for every product and fuel in society that did not exist two hundred years ago, let's never bite the hand that feeds you until you have a replacement. I'm all in. 
let's get rid of fossil fuels. Let's be the first one to say, yay, fossil fuels go away. But you're not going to make petrochemicals. You're not going to make um, uh, pharmaceutical drugs. You're not going to make Band-Aids out of a windmill. You're the only one that would love the grid to go down. I mean, you, every time I tell you my cell phone lost connection, anytime I tell you my power's out, I just see a big grin on your face because you're trying to convince me to go off grid with everything. So, I, Michael, I'm the one up here putting in twin uh, propane tur turbines. I'm putting solar on the roof, putting a wind turbine on. I'm making my own mini grid, and that's going to come in on the last story here in a sec. Let's go to the next story, Michael. Awesome. From noble ambition to corporate tokenism, the rise and fall of ESG. My, how how does electric car maker Tesla have a lower ESG score than a U.S. oil major Exxon, a company that spent decades trying to suppress information about climate change? This one just kind of gets me worked up a bit. A, I think Tesla is going to do well and it's going to survive. Tesla will be the car electric car survivor. Um, defend, ESG has done a great job with the oil and gas uh, industry, getting the governance side of it back in so that the investors get their money back. ESG did do a great job and the oil and gas did that, uh, did, take, did take heart on that. ESG has fallen into Alice Wonderland wormhole where everything isn't what it is, what it isn't. Trotting out a net zero pledge these days is about as significant as telling you, your shareholders, you're interested in making money. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is what, what is absolutely crazy. Tesla has a lower ESG score than Philip Morris, which is a cigarette maker. What? What? I don't get that. That almost sounded like Morris Day in the night. They truly, well, it, it goes to show you that there is political motivations behind this. Six of the eight companies, the exceptions were Shell and BP, also have the goals to increase oil and gas production as well as they should. I mean, you know. Norman Crowley, chairman and founder of Wicklow-based Cool Planet. Um, the indices are BS because they're clearly being game. And this is a guy whose company, Cool Planet, specializes in decarbonization. He would love nothing more than for everybody to take this analytic seriously. But when he, what he's telling you is that when you have Philip Morris being, quote, more ESG-friendly than Tesla— you know something's wrong. I, I just read a great book. It's, uh, I, I don't know the name of it, but it's basically on Jeff Bezos and the rollout of Amazon. And they have oh. a great quote. When your gut disagrees with the data, go check how you're collecting your data because generally your gut's right. You know, if you have a metric, you know, the example was they had a metric that said customer support people are getting back to their customers within 90 seconds. Well, Jeff Bezos didn't think that and a lot of the anecdotal evidence he was getting from um People were saying, hey, I'm spending hours on the phone waiting for a dial tone. So what did they do? They just dialed up customer support in the meeting and found out that, yeah, it's like six minutes. So go back to how are you collecting your data? Because it's probably doing it wrong. If Philip Morris, if the data you're collecting gets Philip Morris, a cigarette maker, higher than Tesla, you're collecting your data wrong. And you have no, I'm going, I'm, you know, I award you no points. No. Uh, let me read you the last paragraph of this article. We appear to have deepening climate crisis uh, conditioning with splashier and splashier climate announcements aided by woollier and woollier ESG metrics. Perhaps, it, perhaps it's time to kill off the concept altogether. <laughs> now, I, I have to say, ESG did do a good thing in getting governance, ESG, oil and gas companies there. But uh, it was overtaken. So let's go to the next story here, Michael. Houston storm reveals downside of forced electrification. This was absolutely a hoot. Michael, as we just mentioned in the show, there's still a million people out of power right now. This is just unbelievable. Yeah. 
Biden's uh, energy department has issued final regulations that most stoves sold must be electric by 2028 and most water heaters must be electric by 2029. If they are fully phased in, Houstonians would be far worse off. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 pretty unbelievable. Um, hey, listen to this. The energy research put out that the United States has four quadrillion cubic feet of natural gas, enough for 130 years, 1.7 trillion barrels of oil, more than five times the reserves of Saudi Arabia, enough for 227 years, and 470 billion short tons of coal, enough for 485 years, and 50% more than Russia. Yeah, it's, it's, I say this time and time again, an idea is great. It's how you implement it, though. And we have done a bad job of implementing electrification. And so, you know, all you you can run all the reports you want, but the anecdotal evidence evidence is people aren't necessarily using electric vehicles. They're not liking it. They're worse off than they were before, especially in Houston. Why would you want to strand yourself in the middle of nowhere with an EV? I don't get it. Uh, no, the the now. Um, listening to Doomberg today and David Blackman, I they were dead on right, and I guarantee you, I'm going to look at a SUV that is a hybrid for my next car. Uh, besides my Ford, uh, I'm going to have a Ford 350 and a hybrid. I'm all about hybrids. I'm, I'm oh, absolutely. absolutely with you on hybrids. The real question, though, is. From an EV stamp, you know, I, I would, I think Teslas are sweet. I'd buy a Tesla, but it's not going to be my primary vehicle. That's, I think, the key part of all of this is it's not your primary vehicle. Or it's not there yet. And I do not want to have it where it will drive itself away or be able to be hacked or be driven running me over. Look, I got an ex-wife out there that hates my guts. Why in the world would I want a car that would drive over me? I don't know. Let's go to the next one here. New microgrid to provide resilience for Houston data center and the grid. Michael, this is my prediction. This, this is the tagline on here. The microgrid will be uh, located at Via Source Solutions Via Center in Houston, a mixed use technology hub that will be home to high performance computing data center, more than 200 data labs, and mission critical infrastructure. What we're witnessing right now with microgrids, AI, and the advent of this type of article coming out is you're going to see electrification becoming um, racially motivated. And you're going to hang on. You're, I know you threw up. I, you just threw up. For our podcast listeners, yeah. Michael Tanner was about to go, Stuart, I'm cutting this podcast right now. Now, listen to me. Where I'm going with this is those that have the money are going to be able to afford a microgrid. Those that can afford a microgrid will be able to survive the um, ramifications of the bad energy policies, just like the million folks that are out of power in ERCOT in Texas today because of the storms and the electrification and the bad problems that happen there, those with microgrids will remain up. And that the disproportionately impacted communities will not have microgrids because of the costs. So anyway. Yeah, it's, I'm with you, you know, microgrids and being able to have redundant systems are going to be critical for this, you know, we talked at nauseum yesterday about data centers and how much power they're going to be using. So it, it's going to be critical. The real question is, though, are we going to build it smart? You know, the, I yeah, love the my power, the, the question is. The Goldman Sachs says the, the estimates that by 2030, the U.S. could need to add as much as 47 gigawatts of power generation just to support new data centers. Goldman Sachs never got anything wrong, so I, I'm, I'm with you there. 
Well, they tried to hire you twice. Were they say were they wrong when they tried to hire you, or were they wrong they didn't hire you? I was I was uh, I wasn't bullish enough for them. Oh, okay. You know, um, <laughs> I wasn't wasn't bullish enough for them. They asked me where I thought natural gas prices were going, and I said, eh. Well, actually, they tried to hire me for their natural gas desk, but I was I was I wasn't bullish enough. Their oil desk didn't want to hire me because I wasn't bullish enough. If you remember, guys, I was I was all over natural gas prices booming, and I just so I swung and missed at that one. So, um, cool. That's it for me. All right. Well, we'll dive into to finance here, guys. But before we do that, we got to pay the bills around here, as always. Um, the news and analysis, or quote unquote analysis you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. The best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit the description below. Links all uh, links to the articles and timestamps so you can jump around and listen to whatever you want. You can also check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Um, let's go ahead, though, and jump into finance, guys. Top-line numbers, fairly flat. S&P 500, uh, basically flat. NASDAQ up about a quarter of a percentage point. Uh, Two-year yields, exactly flat. Ten-year yields down about uh, five, uh, about you know, 0.04 percentage points. Dollar index, fairly flat. Um, we did see Bitcoin drop about 1.6 percentage points after we saw about 5.3 billion of Bitcoin move via two different transactions. This looks to be um, via um, a settlement from from the hack from uh, the MT. I'm not a Bitcoin guy, so I may get this wrong, but eh, from the stuff I read, it looked like it was a settlement from a hack that happened to a, a Korean Bitcoin exchange five ten years ago. Um, so it seems to be that was uh, federal regulators kind of just settling that up. Um, we also saw crude oil jump about 2.71 percentage points, um, uh, yeah, jump 2.1 percentage points, currently trading 80, 20, 80, 28, which is absolutely unbelievable. Um, nice to see it pop above that $80 mark. We did see natural gas prices uh, up to $2.69, um, you know, for, for oil. You know, really, we we saw a little bit of a weaker dollar today, but but mainly when you combine what's going on with the projected demand of summer driving season, layering on top of that, it is expected that OPEC is going to continue the cuts, but also possibly sprinkle in maybe a little bit of topper, um, which which could happen. You know, we've got Jim Rittenberg or Jim Ritterbush of Rittenberg and Associates. You know, it's it's the guy who owns his own company. I love this Rittenberg and Associates. It's like so. It's you and a hoodie and a laptop. You know, I mean, I love. Yeah, we we could talk. We could talk all day. I don't need to. We we don't need to crap on the guy too much. But th his quote is: "This week's upsides follows through, or or this week's upside follow through is being facilitated by significant weakening in the dollar and a growing consensus that OPEC Plus will extend production cuts at the upcoming weekly meeting." Whoa, deep analysis right there. Deep, deep analysis. Good for that guy. Um, we have no API crude oil inventories as we uh, yesterday, as we saw, um, due to the fact that we have where uh, markets were closed on Monday. So as you listen to this, you will see API crude oil inventories in the afternoon, and then on Thursday you'll see both crude oil inventories um, and natural gas inventories, which will be a good. Uh, the only other things do I saw today, um, we did see a merger on the midstream side. Energy transfer goes ahead and pays $3.25 billion for WTG midstream. Um, you know, they are the largest private Permian gas gatherer and processing business um, with assets located all around uh, Midland Basin. Some of the my highlights here, this expands energy transfers, natural gas pipeline and processing network um, by about, you know, 1.3 BCF. Per day, and they got about two more gas processing months under construction for about 0.4 BCF per day. Uh, it's about 6,000 lines, uh, miles of gathering pipeline. It also includes a 20% ownership of the BNAGL NGL pipeline. Um, you know, obviously they, they they're estimating some discounted cash flow accretion, so we love that. Um, it was a structure; it was a mix of cash and equity. Um, uh, uh, via the purchase there's there's three owners here um 
there's three owners as part of this. So Stone Peak, Davis Estate, and Diamondback Energy were the three companies who who owned WT Midstream. So they make a uh, a nice uh, nice out of it. To give you an idea, it was 2.45 billion in cash and about 50. 8 million new shares of energy transfer. Um, theoretically, this will close in the third quarter of 2024. We'll see if if Lena Khan decides to go ahead and approve that one. You know, we, we don't know about that. Um, so these pipelines cross Martin, Howard, Upton, and Reagan counties. Um, again, we also, you know, we, we talked about the eight processing plants. Um, you know, it's pretty... Uh, this is going... We're going to see midstream roll-up happen because... You're not able to, to build new pipelines. So if your energy transfer, how do you grow? You can't grow if you can't build a pipeline. So the only way to grow is to what? Purchase. It's somewhat similar to what's happening in, in, in the upstream market, except upstream's buying because they're realizing the cost of drilling on a per barrel basis is more than it is to acquire. So in that scenario, when you have cash lying around, the only thing you can do is purchase. On the midstream side, in my opinion, it comes down to the regulatory environment. You just can't build a pipeline. If you could build a pipeline, I think companies would be building them all over the place. But I think it's really difficult, and it's there is a, obviously a big capital intent, but this becomes much attractive. And, you know, much like we're going to see, in my opinion, five oil companies in the next 50, you know, and we look back 15 years from now, we're all... There's going to be the USA oil company. It's all we're all it's all just going to be one. They're going to end up regulating, you know, you know, it's a whole nother thing we could get into with with what the FTC is going on um, and all these lawsuits. You think these lawsuits are going to make it more attractive for people to start their own oil and gas companies? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're going to end up with three oil companies that truly do have cartel power, um, not like what was uh, alleged by the FTC and what Pioneer was doing. Unbelievable. I'm still worked up about over that. But what you're seeing in the midstream space is legislation through regulation forcing now companies to Wow, we're just going to roll up this business. It's not good to roll up the business. Who does that hurt? You, the consumer. Whether or not you're an oil company who's got you know contracts that may need to come up and be associated by this, right. or you're a downstream user of this. So, this is what happens when you overregulate businesses. You know the 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 invisible hand that Adam Smith always talked about. It's 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 not a bad thing. It's a bad thing to overregulate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a bad thing. The invisible oh, okay. hand that, that Adam Smith talked about, money. which is the markets regulating themselves. Yes, obviously there are some bad players out there, but you have to look at it as that's the exception and not the rule. When I think this current administration and specifically the FTC and Lena Khan, they view that as the rule, not the exception. Right. All right, well, I'm off my soapbox, Stu. What, what, what should people be worried about? What, what's coming up here? Well, you and I are going to get to visit uh, tomorrow on uh, Thursday for uh, with uh, Senator Ted Cruz. So that'll be a lot of fun. It's going to be great. We got to actually practice your speech here so we don't fumble it. But yes, we'll be great to uh, to to see <laughs> Senator Cruz. Um, we appreciate all he's doing for Texas. Um, it'll be great to see some of the other members of the EMB family as well, Steve Reese and uh, and and Artry Trevino. Everybody, go check them out. But yes. Um, with that, guys, we're going to let you get out of here, get back to work, um, start your Wednesday. Appreciate everybody checking us out. World's greatest podcast, energynewsbeat.com. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.